My name is Seth Zachary. I'm the chairman of Paul Hastings, a global law firm. In the 80s, we began to recognize that the future was a bigger, broader future beyond employment law and beyond Los Angeles. And later than many of our competitors, we began to spread east to New York and Washington and Atlanta, actually in, in reverse order. Today, we have about a thousand lawyers. Our largest office by far is in New York. We have about 30% of our revenue overseas. The employment law practice, which we still feel is the finest in the United States, is about 10% of our firm, and uh, we're following our clients further and further beyond that. We had been, for a variety of reasons, very early in Tokyo, and very successful in Tokyo. And it had to do with some twists and turns with some very large clients of the firm. So we found ourselves in an odd position. Uh, a relatively immature corporate practice and doing great corporate work in Tokyo for Japanese clients. Almost a dyslexia, but what, what it taught us was strange that in a way, um, as we were building our firm, things that could happen around the world or certainly out of Los Angeles could lead the firm and could tug us forward as opposed to a um, more traditional Louis Cator's theory that Everything emanates from the center of the world, be it New York or Los Angeles. Um, Tokyo whetted our appetite to go further, and, and so we did go into Hong Kong, Shanghai, and then, and then Beijing. And our progress there has been amazing, but not linear. In the sense, we had uh, ebbs and flows, we stubbed our toes, we've broken our ankles. Um, and we've enjoyed great success, but what we've done, um, and which is why the attention that's current in China is not terribly daunting to us, is um, we, our, our practice has changed so dramatically. We serve our clients there, um, domestic clients from the U.S. and Europe, and Chinese clients with that skill set. We have no interest in practicing Chinese law. We have no interest in advising on Chinese law. We're not going to compete with the King and Wood, Mallison type of structure or other structures where there are mergers with big Chinese law firms. We have a different approach than some of these mega mergers. A few factors exist in that market. One is um, the freshness and newness of the market. Uh, means that some clients may not be acquainted with the value of the global law, law advice and a willingness to necessarily pay what, what it takes. Two, there's a plethora of lawyers in China and there are enormous pricing pressures. And three, um, business in, in that market ebbs and flows. For us, um, I, 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 as I mentioned, our progress has not been linear. And we've begun a process about five years ago of focusing on a smaller number of leading Chinese, Korean, Japanese, European, and American clients whose interests are uh, the export and import of capital, technology, um, rights, and protection of rights that value and um, focus on leading law firm legal advice. So we've been able to turn those offices into work importers, work exporters, relationship developers, client leaders, um, and follow those clients around the world. We're not a firm that segments profitability by office in a very finite way, certainly not for the last 15 years. And because we don't believe that's the best way to move work and opportunities around the firm. But by any measure of accounting, our offices in Asia are profitable. And uh, we've changed their size, we've changed their focus, we've changed their leverage to ensure that. But um, it is a challenge in our industry. I see the market as segmenting and tiering dramatically. Um, and I see high value work becoming increasingly concentrated in a smaller number of firms. 
I see a, a greater differentiation in the recruitment of talent, in the retention of talent, in the um, global strength of law firms. And I think there's a bit of a metaphor between what's happening in the law business to what's happening in society. I'm not a person who would live and die by Thomas Piketty, but I, I do think that the middle is struggling. Now, why is the middle struggling? I think the middle is struggling because the middle and the lower middle has to provide the same level of service, the same level of courage, Courage, the same level of associate comp, the same level of technology, the same level of rent, and the pricing differential as the value proposition changes, changes the margins. For many years they changed the margins gently, and then they changed the margins aggressively. But today, in what's generally a flat demand environment, we see a situation where all boats are not rising. Now, People might say that some of those boats are treading water. <laughs> Many of those boats are not sinking, and I hope never sink. But the truth of it is, is the top of the market is rising faster. What, what I think is, is interesting to conjecture about if, if the statistics which make that proposition undisputable are true is what the trend line is. And when you get to a place where law firms really are not in the same business. Is number 50 really in the same business as number three? I think that we're in an, an environment that is most analogous to perestroika. And if, if, if anybody, uh, you, you, you may or may not know what perestroika is, but perestroika was the, the moment in time when the Soviet Union collapsed and it was change, and I know there's a better, a better analogy, but change began to happen more and more quickly, almost like a physical force. So um, when I look at the segmentation over the last 10 years, I think we'll see it in the next three years equaling the, the, next, the last 10 years. And there is a fallout from that. Firms will have a different ability to invest, a different ability to field benches that are indisputably superb. And the competition for talent, which uh, I think is not worth lamenting, uh, is real, and I don't think it's bad at all. I think it's probably healthy in reality, because it has to remind us that while our business is professional services and excellence, we're in a business. And to deny that we're in a business is, I think, quite fail. Our calculus has changed. Our calculus has gone um, much further away to the metric nature of a book of business and much more towards what the addition of that person and his or her practice will do to the firm's journey and strategy and practice area. First thing we look at is the reputation of the individual as a client leader, whether or not that business is portable. Um, if the person has that reputation, particularly in an area that's important to us, we, we try to come up with an offer, a financial offer, that's compelling with two criteria. One is that that offer fits into our structure, and we've worked hard to create that structure. And two, that the offer expresses our enthusiasm for the candidate. But we recognize that while we can be extraordinarily competitive, we're not unique in that role, and we're certainly not the most profitable law firm in the world. There's a little bit of a recipe, I think, and I'll use uh, words that are loaded words. Entrepreneurial. Uh, entrepreneurial is a code word in our industry for um, maybe having a book of business and focusing very much on the individual developing that business. Neither good nor bad. Other code word, institutional. Firms that don't look at those qualities and may eschew those qualities based on a more societal approach to business. 
I think what we offer collateral and we only want people that will buy into what we offer them is a mix of an ability to develop your reputation, develop your client following, um, and share the excitement of the firm in its journey, expose yourself to the firm's clients, and permit the firm to expose themselves to your client. So someone has to um, exhibit both those qualities. The $20 million practitioner who has his or her team, his or her clients, wants to keep it that way and market it based on some percentage of gross is not attractive to us. In the lateral courting process, any sense that the lateral isn't representing themselves, not that we all don't suffer from some element of self-delusion, but that the lateral isn't representing themselves honestly is a turnoff to us. And any jump ball, we protect the firm in that no problem walking away too. I think a lateral has to understand the firm's journey and the firm's culture, regardless of the book of business that the lateral um, might bring us. We built a firm that's more important than any lateral, that's more important than any group of laterals. And if that lateral just doesn't understand the journey, and that's manifested in lots of ways. It's manifested in not understanding our compensation system and what drives that system, what those incentives are. And if the lateral doesn't respect those incentives, they won't respect the firm and they won't be a part of the journey that, that's useful. Um, so I think all those things um, in a courting process and wondering whether people will fit, no matter how broad our panoply is of personalities, whether people will make the firm and our culture stronger and richer, is what we consider and we have no problem walking away. What happened to that firm over a period of time, and I don't know what, what its number was, but 30 years ago it had 700 lawyers, so it was... It was the second largest, according Se to what I read. Okay, second largest firm in the States, and obviously it's, it's gone. Um, did inform my own viewpoint. Um, in, in some ways, I was, I was fortunate to come to Paul Hastings before that firm met its demise, uh, but, um, and I was only there for a few years, but notwithstanding, I saw the lives of people um, horrifically affected by that firm's demise. And strangely enough, those were people who were in the fabric of the firm uh, and couldn't replicate that again, through no fault of their own. Uh, that has impacted me. Um, it has made me prize the security and direction of our firm. And it has made me realize that, that what keeps a firm strong is two things. It is the financial success of the firm, but more importantly, the confidence in the future of the firm. And some level of engagement, because every partner is different, in the journey of the firm that creates some level of professional satisfaction or professional reward in addition to that sense of confidence in the firm. And uh, I think the reason that someone might say that I'm extreme in that viewpoint and not tolerant of um, dissent in that viewpoint is probably because from afar, um, seven blocks down Park Avenue where I was and where that firm was when it met its demise, I thought of it as tragic and horrible and avoidable. And so that's obviously impacted me a little bit. The world is changing and I think clients are seeking new ways to create value in those representations and one large school of thought is creating a symmetry between the win for the client and the win for the law firm. And we have no reluctance whatsoever to be part of that symmetry or to respond to that symmetry. We have no reluctance at all to work on the billable hour and, and um, in a more traditional way um, permit the client to absorb 
benefits and the burdens of the results of that representation. Our goal is to do what the client wants, what the client feels most comfortable about. And for the first time, we're seeing more value or alternative-based fee agreements. People have been talking about it forever, but it's beginning to happen uh, more and more. <clears throat> I think that there probably is a misunderstanding uh, about the antithesis of the billable hour and whether or not it really is antithetical to the client's interest. But whether there's a misunderstanding or there isn't, I think every general counsel feels more comfortable with his or her own mode of, of billing and it, it's based on the matter. We're completely flexible about that. But I think that, that notwithstanding the chit-chat and the discussion of uh, cap fees, value, um, over under closed deal discounts with blended rates. The firms that will succeed really will succeed when the client sees the value proposition. And the client really sees that when its biggest concern or biggest risk or biggest opportunity um, is up for grabs, they want that lawyer to do it because they believe the value is there. How you package that value I think we're entirely comfortable about.